doing Caesar Grace's Jiu Jitsu Monday through Friday, 7.30. So if you want to learn how to put the ass whooping down, come through. I want to say Caesar Grace's Jiu Jitsu all day from the very beginning. I feel great. I'm training hard. I've never been more motivated. I got the best camp behind me, Caesar Gracie. I just want to thank everybody, the Caesar Gracie fight team, Nick Nate Diaz, Jake Shields, Scrap Pack. Caesar Gracie Jiu Jitsu a war cry that ricocheted through the core of the scrap pack. It was a lifestyle that forged one of the most iconic teams the MMA world has ever seen. Nick Diaz, Nate Diaz, Jake Shields, Gilbert Melendez. These are the names that dominated in the twilight of the 2000s, rose to fame outside of the world's biggest promotion, and cemented themselves in MMA amongst the fans and the history books. But prior to all of that, prior to the pack, there was just one. The first black belt under Caesar Gracie, and his rise through the grappling scene in the early 2000s was swift and aggressive. It was clear that upon his arrival to the Octagon in 2004, the UFC had a golden boy on their hands. A homegrown star to help shape, rebuild and repair their abandoned 185 pound division and rival the dominance of Pride's star-studded middleweight roster. And while such a glorious prophecy did prevail for one man, for David Terrell, a prospect with so much potential, it just wasn't meant to be. Hi, I'm Tom from MMA On Point, and welcome to our brand new series, where we'll be talking about some unique and maybe fairly unknown stories. Today, we have The Descent of David Terrell, the UFC's most promising career. The year is 1992. The optimism of the late 80s is gone, an economic recession sweeps over the US, and Caesar Gracie Jiu Jitsu has landed in Northern California. Straight from the LA garage mats of Horian, Caesar sets out to establish himself as a major play in the Gracie brand, a brand that had begun to populate itself all over the Golden State thanks to Horian's injection of BJJ into popular culture. Horian's departure from the family in Brazil and the pressures of his father's expectations led him to Hollywood, notably teaching Mel Gibson the triangle choke and lethal weapon. And for the American raised Caesar, his surname all of a sudden harnessed a lot of opportunity. I, I don't think I moving here, I realized the significance really of the art, if you will, how big it was. Now, Horion only taught like movie stars and stuff. You know, he would he would teach like a uh, celebrity. When you got your black belt from, I guess, your Uncle Hobson, if I'm correct, you weren't really training with him. Was it a matter of your other relatives saying, hey, Uncle Hobson, we just want you to ceremonially give it to him and then no I, I never trained under hobson what happened was henzo petitioned it for me and then and then hobson you know promoted me of course it was 1993 in the ultimate fighting championship that saw horian's entrepreneurship of his father's self-defense system really reach its true potential with the bases loaded up with gracie academies caesar was one of the first to run through as hoist wrapped his arm around gerard godot's neck That was it. And so we got, I got pretty popular, you know, in the area known as like, that's the place to go. You know, if you will, those guys are real. Among the 86,000 people to buy the UFC pay-per-view, Mike Camacho was watching. A name that really wouldn't mean anything to you, but everything to a 15-year-old David Terrell. Barely knowing his biological father who died when Terrell was five, Camacho, David's stepfather, was a former wrestler and would introduce David into the world of combat, advocating for a variation of martial arts and the pursuit of pure competition throughout his youth. Though Santa Rosa, California had no jiu-jitsu at the time, he did attend a local sambo class, and while it gave David the opportunity to drill some different positions, his ability to tap the instructor in his first class immediately capped his progression. Luckily for him, some years later, he discovered that there was a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy in Concord, California, a 90-minute drive from his hometown. Town. For a kid dreaming of being Hoist Gracie and the aspiration of becoming a professional fighter himself, this is what he needed to get to the next level. So he got in his car. Yeah. 
upon his arrival, he was met by none other than Half Gracie. Recruited by Caesar to add some more legitimacy to his gym, David was immediately met with a teacher that really practiced what he preached. Introducing the infamous Half Gracie. David's desire to learn motivated him to make the three hour round trip twice a week. And it didn't take Caesar too long to realize he had someone special on his hands. At the time, Caesar didn't really have many students. He was trying to build up a student base, trying to prove to the rest of the Gracies that he could establish himself within the family as a good teacher. And now with a young and hungry student like David, he had an ace up his sleeve. Caesar began entering him into various competitions on the west coast and David tore him up and spit him out, just mowed through people. Talent, ability and dedication had met a now measurable lucrative future and David was fully in. He quit his job at the construction site, moved to Concord to train full time and was supplemented by Caesar with an assistant instructor job at the gym. The two knew they could go far. It wasn't all easy work though, with MMA unsanctioned during the late 90s in California, David's fights were mostly unrecorded. He took fights in back alley tournaments and local gymnasiums, his mother disapproved and his girlfriend's parents thought he was a thug, but this is what he wanted to do more than anything. And his first pro but unrecorded fight took place in a small school rec room alongside the likes of BJ Penn, Gil Castillo and Steve Heath, a fight which he handedly sliced through with a rear naked choke. How many unrecorded fights David participated in are unknown. The banning of unregulated fights by the state athletic commissions nationally led by John McCain stifled a lot of career growth for promoters and fighters during this time, but according to his official record, his recorded debut came at IFC Warriors Challenge 4 in 1999. Ultimate fighting has now been banned in five states and fighter Ken Shamrock has left the octagon and entered the ring. He's now a professional wrestler. While the attack on the sport led the UFC to hold events in smaller, more rural states such as Georgia and Alabama, the IFC emerged across seas in Kiev. Hello, I'm Ned Smith and welcome again to International Fighting Championships. We're inside Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, a packed house, 16,000 here at the National Sports Palace. Sporting a strikingly similar logo to the UFC, the existence of the IFC is a bizarre one. Allegedly bankrolled by Andy Anderson. As Andy Anderson brings them both to the center. Andy Anderson, by the way, an Olympic uh, referee. Yep, that Andy Anderson. A UFC 5 competitor that got his time in the cage by supplying ring girls from his nude steakhouse. Wait, how could a nude steakhouse bankroll end? Oh, and uh, eventually he got imprisoned for methamphetamine trafficking and money laundering, so... Maybe he could afford it. The promotion did have rocky starts as Buddy Alban, former site coordinator for the UFC, essentially sold the event to the Ukrainians under the assumption that they were getting the UFC. Alban already really known for his shady dealings at UFC 6 and that pretty quick submission. They both have the same promoter, Buddy Alban. And Alban has chosen to go in Taktarov's corner for this particular fight. So the name and the logo changed at the last minute after Bob Myrowitz threatened to sue. The event, however, did prevail, even in the face of the Russian Mafia, who made it difficult for officials to retrieve the tapes from the country for commercial distribution. Suffice to say, the IFC didn't return to Russia and instead paved the way for the UFC in Mississippi for the first ever state athletic commission sanctioned event, IFC 2 Mayhem in Mississippi. Despite the knockoff brand, the IFC was instrumental in the advancement of rules, even holding many events in Quebec and California from 1998, which established uniform rules of MMA. Before the fight tonight, there was a very animated rules meeting presided over by Alwyn Morris of the Ganawage Athletic Commission. And the rules are primarily designed for fighter safety. No one gets seriously hurt in these events because of the rules. Welcome fight fans to the Table Mountain Casino here in Fryan, California. 
What you will see before you tonight is the most radical and fastest growing full contact sport in the world. Imagine a world of unsanctioned fights where you, you know you do what you have to do to win and all of a sudden there are rules and criteria. Taking a last minute fight with Vernon White who already had 33 big fights to his name, fighting legends like Frank Shamrock and Bass Rutan in Pancrase and Kazuchi Sakuraba at Pride 2 just one fight prior, David lost a controversial unanimous decision that night at heavyweight. But ultimately returned to the IFC cage with light heavyweight championship victories, notably over Marcus De Silva, headlining over former middleweight champion Rich Franklin, a man who David might have always been on a collision course with if life went another way. During this time, it was full on war at Caesar Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Nick Diaz debuted at IFC Warriors Challenge 15 a few months after David's title defense and won the welterweight title against Chris Lytle at Warriors Challenge 17. And with the team beginning to dominate the Californian scene, Caesar Gracie finally promoted David to black belt. The recent success and belt promotion opened a lot of doors for him, even making a monumental move to open his own academy in Northern Santa Rosa. He also changed his attention to competitive jiu-jitsu, a place he really thrived with victories over the likes of Dean Lister and Ricardo Almeida. And these tournaments featured the likes of Jacare Souza, Yushin Okami, Nate Marquardt. And through 2002 to 2003, he became the ADCC Trials Champion, Gracie Open Super Fight Champion both in 2000 2002 and 2003, Grappler's Quest West Coast Tournament Champion and took the ADCC third place. The guy was on the up and up. During this short time away from MMA, there had however been a major shift in the scene. Dana White, Frank and Lorenzo Fatita. While the IFC continued to thrive throughout 2001, producing nine California-based shows and introducing MMA fans to the Champions of Tomorrow, the UFC were on the brink of bankruptcy. Fortunately for them, the Station Casino brothers offered them $2 million, which was accepted in January 2001. So Dana White, who was managing Chuck Adele and Tito Ortiz at the time, assumed the presidency role, and with the high societal connections to Trump in New Jersey, and more importantly, Lorenzo's history as the commissioner of the Nevada State Athletic Commission, the UFC began to make their presence known once again, moving from rural auditoriums to the most extravagant casinos on the Las Vegas Strip. And while training partners like Nick started turning their attention to the big new shows of the UFC, David, however, was heading to Japan for his return to MMA. While Zufa had begun to invest millions of dollars back into the American scene, Japan was just thriving with the likes of Pride Fighting championships and K1 kickboxing which were selling out stadiums. So with that said, David signed a deal to fight for Pancrase and returned against Yuki Sasaki in December of 2003 in dramatic fashion, demonstrating that despite his jiu-jitsu success, he still had heavy punches to throw. <laughs> And no doubt this gained the attention of UFC matchmaker Joe Silver. But it was his submission win against Osami Shibuya which really sealed the deal for Joe and the UFC when an unprecedented and honestly overlooked historical trade was made. When I left Pancrase, I still had a contract. What they did is they traded me to the UFC. They took three Pancrase fighters and gave them three fights apiece if they let me out of my contract. So once the trade was complete, it was a quick turnaround for David as the UFC gave him one of the toughest tests he'd had seen to date, Team Quest's Matt Linlan at UFC 49. Whilst the purchase of the UFC by White and the Fatitas had opened up a world of opportunity for fighters in the US, it also came with a cavalcade of problems for the owners. Along with the UFC lightweight title mishaps that saw the title disappear for several years, the UFC middleweight title was also suffering. The debacle of Murillo Bustamante subbing Matt Linlan twice at UFC 35 and then leaving the UFC for pride in late 2002 really didn't help. The division was left without a champion, and at the distaste of the UFC, Matt Linlan was making strides to fill that void. According to John Hackleman, Dana White just really didn't like him and didn't want him anywhere near that belt. So, enter David Terrell. They had a weird thing against the guy at the time. They really wanted me to beat him, you know? Mm. They made it clear that they wanted me to, to, to bring me in to, to beat this guy. The trade was done, David was here, and he was to step in the cage 11 years after Gracie Jiu-Jitsu changed his life watching Hoist Gracie defeat three men in one night 
and he was staring across a formidable Olympic medalist. But within a flash, David changed his life. A long time of hard work and grinding in the gym had accumulated in a 24 second knockout of the number one contender. Everything that Joe Silver and the UFC thought he could be was now a reality. I've waited 10 years to get in this octagon and you guys seen it. <laughs> but honestly, the reality behind it, David was hurting. A lifetime of competing was starting to catch up with him, and injuries had started to plague his body. And the fame, money, and opportunity only really acted as a mask for something that maybe he just wasn't prepared for, an instant middleweight title fight. And amongst the sea of emerging middleweight talent, there was just one man in his way, and might have been anyone else that night, we might be telling a different story. Being a champion's a way to get a message out. Don't stop, don't get discouraged. If you can't beat a thing, go around it, you know? sidestep it. Never lose faith that it can be done. No matter what, you can never lose faith that it can be done, whatever it is. While David had his own life goals, Evan Tanner was on a path to fulfill his destiny. A 12-fight UFC vet with a record of 30 wins and only 4 losses. A former USWF heavyweight champion, extreme challenge heavyweight tournament winner, pancreas neo blood tournament winner and former challenger of the UFC light heavyweight title. And Tanner had found his way to the middleweight title fight after a triangle choke finish of none other than ruthless Robbie Lawler. For a 5 and one prospect coming in as a minus 140 favorite. Stock as Terrell being the next middleweight champion was high and come February 2005 at Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas in front of the 11,000 people in attendance, he crumbled. The truth is, Evan Tanner was just more deserving in that moment. He had walked through fire to have that belt wrapped around his waist, and is an inspiration to many, and will obviously forever be remembered by the MMA world. But for David, that moment really got to him. With a struggle making the 185 pound limit, everything seemed to have just been going in the wrong direction for him. He left his gear at the arena that night, his cup, mouthpiece, and robe. It seemed that everything died at that moment. His drive and ambition to continue when he had already sacrificed so much was near an end. Over the course of the next year, he stayed at home. The friends that he made after his knockout win of Matt Linlan were gone and he was alone. He did attempt to rebound from the loss with a quick turnaround against Trevor Prangley at UFC 54, but was struck with an elbow injury that could only heal through 100 days of inactivity or he risked re-injury. His body was breaking down as quick as his mind, and who was David really without his athletic career? They were talking about another, you know, another title fight, win one more, have another title. But as, you know, my wife got pregnant and I started having kids, I just, I don't know, I didn't like that lifestyle, just kind of the person that sure. I became. You're put up on this pedestal, everyone's giving you free sponsors and money, and I didn't like it. Once yeah. I decided to settle down. I think I would have still continued to fight if it was like once a year. But Crosley Gracie w said to me one time, he said, Dave, you know, if I make 40 grand off my academy every month and I got to go train for three months for this fight and I'm only getting 20 grand to fight, you know, you're fighting for a title in the UFC and you're getting 10 grand or something. It just got old, you know, at first I, I loved competing and I would have done it for free at first, but after a while of just training that hard and pulling me away from my academy, I was like, man, I just, I don't know, I just wanted to be there for my family, you know, I didn't, just was time, you know, I competed my whole life. I loved competing. David realized that the times were changing. Young, hungry competitors were on their way up in the sport and he had to make a choice. Family and stability or the perilous pursuit of the belt. 
While David did return to the UFC in 2006 with a win over Scott Smith, this would be the last time he stepped foot in the octagon. The truth is, David had achieved his destiny. And destiny wasn't a shiny title or a Hall of Fame status or even really being remembered by the fans. It was the young smiling faces at his thriving gym in Northern Santa Rosa that looked up to him as a coach and a leader. Away from the bright lights of the UFC cage, Terrell found peace in cleaning the mats every night when the students left, pouring himself into the 200 students to follow in the footsteps of MMA greats. 